I wanted the girls to do well, have a good marriage. Um, and we can't have that. We saw some guys, and I went up to two guys, two grown men weeping on each other's shoulders. I said, guys, what, what, what's been going on in there? He said, there's been dying in there. I said, dying? He said, dying. I mean, he got angry with me because I didn't kind of accept the word. I think Vicky realised I was quite upset that I was going off to sit in the um, north stand on my own. And uh, she called my name and ran up to me and gave me an extra hug and a kiss. So they went off down the tunnel. I went to get a coffee. They always tried to dump me at about this point because obviously they had friends to see and they didn't want the old man hanging about. I saw what I now know was Victoria uh, being passed over and handled out through the gate onto the pitch. And in that minute or couple of minutes that it took me to get you know, across the pen and back again, um, lo and behold, they're almost side by side, Sarah and Victoria, on the pitch. So we picked Vicky up and we put her in the ambulance. You know, I went to the back ready to get off to get Sarah. As we literally stood onto the pitch, the ambulance was full and I left to this awful dilemma. Do I get back on the ambulance and go with Vicky and leave Sarah alone? Or do I go and look after her on the basis that, you know, Vicky's in the ambulance? And, um, well, if there's a low point in your life, that's it, I think. Jenny and Trevor Hicks lost both their daughters at Hillsborough. Someone came out of, out of the coma when Kenny was speaking to me, which was, was brilliant. We were all laughing and we went light-hearted for, for, you know, for, for five minutes or so, and then the realisation came when we went upstairs to another ward and one of the doctors said to me, can you just go and have a, have a word in, in, in the young lads? I won't say his name because it's not fair. You know, the young lads here. I said, of course I will. So I went over and spoke in his ear and said, when you come out of this sleep, you know, we'll be waiting for you in the, in the dressing room. We'll have some balls and shirts. And, you know, and you can meet the lads, you know, promise you. Uh, the doctor said, thanks very much. And, and I said to him, when, when will, will the young lad be, be OK? Well, he, well, he said, no, we're cutting off the machine in this afternoon. And you could have cut me in half. Mm -hmm. Just, I couldn't believe it. And that, that's, that was probably the final blow for me. We make sure somebody, you know, the fucking Asians would be at every funeral. And I think the families really respected that. I mean, the boys weren't really obtrusive in any way. They sat back and they let the family go on with the grieving. They were there because they wanted it. You know, the, the, the first one you, you go is, is, is arduous, and then you, one day I think we went to three, in you know, the morning, noon, yeah. and the afternoon. It was the two girls, the extra girls, and there was the, there was the brothers from Natalie, and, and then there was a big coffin come past me and looked behind, and there was a small coffin behind it. It was, it was a, a dad and his lad. And uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, it's something that everybody wished had never happened. Um, but I think it's also something that nobody should forget.
Big Hill Hill, and welcome to the uh, Homeboys Extra podcast. Uh, my name, of course, is Joe McKenna. I'm not this week joined by David Harper. I am, of course, joined by uh, Jason Higgins and Paul Larkin on the line. Say hello, fellas. Hello, fellas. All right, boys. And this extra podcast uh, is is a lot for people to talk about currently. It's very relevant. It's very recent. And the reason we're doing this podcast is uh, Celtic supporters and Liverpool supporters have a lot in common. They draw a lot of parallels through uh, cities. Glasgow and Liverpool have a lot of things in common. Irish diaspora, shipping industry, um, working class mentality, and football, of course. And we have tonight a man called Eddie Bernan on the line. And Eddie Be- Eddie's going to talk to us about the... Uh, the Hillsborough disaster and about the recent re- revelations that have uh, come out in the report. And uh, we thought here at Homeboys it would be a, a great idea to get someone like Eddie on to talk to us about how people of Liverpool, how Liber- Liverpool supporters are dealing with what has happened and how you know people are, are viewing things and basically the overall impact of Hillsborough upon uh, those people and their club. And uh, we have Eddie on the line here. Eddie, uh, far away and say hello there, mate. All right, boys. Uh, I'm Eddie Bynan. Uh, I might as well tell you, I'm a red. I wasn't at Hillsborough on that day. I was on Hillsborough the, the year before. And I can tell you now, you could see the signs then. Now, I won't go through you know, all the demographics of what happened. You know what happened, don't you, boys? Uh, Liverpool were given the smallest end of the ground when they didn't say they wanted it. When Liverpool FC officially went to the FA, he said, no, you have that end of the ground. Liverpool's average gate that season was 50,000. We got 28,000 tickets. There was 28 turnstiles at that end. Three were open, right? The year before, the police, expecting trouble from Liverpool supporters, had plenty of police around, no trouble at all. The Liverpool supporters filed in into the files they were given. The year after, the police... I had a brand new operator at the ground. He said, no problem last year, lads. These Liverpool supporters are great. And we were left to our own devices, right? You can imagine the ensuing problems that happened. I'll, 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 you know, the, the, you ball Celtic supporters, you all want to get in. Not to ever getting in. Just to play. But he opened the, the big gate at the side. And lost the gate. The Liverpool supporters were in but they were directed to not a tunnel at either side, one tunnel. You weren't allowed to go in the side tunnels, just the one tunnel. Now the rest is history, you know, it's too it's too gruesome to even speak. Now the, the bravery of Liverpool people was was really legendary on the day. But the point I'd like to make, and you've probably read a bit about it in the paper, is the cover up. I make no mistake, boys, this was no ordinary cover up. This was a cover up against working-class people and Liverpool people in particular. Now, this police force was stringent four years before in the miners' strike, and they were sort of praised by Margaret Thatcher, the job they'd done by keeping working-class people down. Like the same police force took on Liverpool, and Humanera was a little bit involved, right? Now, it all went wrong. It all went wrong for the police, and they panicked. They panicked. Make no mistake about it. When they found out the sort of catastrophic things that were happening, they decided there and then for a cover-up. They turned all police phones off so nobody could get in touch. Nobody had mobile phones then on on our side, so we couldn't do anything. Right. I'll finish about the... I'll I'll, I'll finish about the catastrophe. We all know what happened to the people. But on on a Sunday morning, this is fact, this... Six top policemen met in a restaurant and decided, let's cover our arses here, lads. Let's cover our arses. And they did. They got strategically placed policemen to get 160, over 160 statements altered. Fact, not fiction, not folklore. Definite, definite. Right? When Margaret Thatcher came the next day, she was briefed on, on the situation. She was told by the police, which she took in, that it was drunken Liverpool louts at that end. Now, some of their intelligence informed here, this police force is a little bit dodgy, you know. This intelligence might, might, might not be right. And she said there and then, I do not want, I do not want this police force criticised. I want, I want 
any criticism deflected away from the police. She never particularly said the Liverpool supporters, but we know where it went, boys. We know where it went. And I won't tell you about the gruesome things afterwards, but within within four days, Liverpool was demonised as robbers, louts, uh, urinating on people, sexually abusing dead people or in, un- unconscious women. Now, what they didn't realise, they thought we were all just all... Majority of us are working class people, but there was doctors, there was policemen, there was solicitors, there was businessmen in that Leppings Laid End. And let's face it, <laughs> in the strata of the life, they are listened to, even by the police. Once it became clear that some of these people saying, oh no boys, that didn't happen, they really turned it on, they really turned it on. They started taking blood, t- blood samples from 10 year old kids, trying to see if they were drunk. They accessed the police, uh, the police computer system to see if any of the any of the dead people had criminal records. Now you know what this this is on a this is on a par of Bloody Sunday, I would say Mississippi and Sharpville. Let's face it, mate. They let it's it's fact and not fiction. They let over forty people who weren't dead, who weren't dead, who could have been saved. They were declined medical assistance because they would not let the ambulances onto the pitch. Now, this is all common knowledge in Liverpool for 23 years, and these families have been trying to put this forward, and even the Labour government under Jack Straw would not listen to us, would not listen to us. But in the end, the uh, internet and websiting and sort of networking, the word got round, this, hey mate, this is bigger than you think. And and eventually they did have to capitulate, and you probably read as football supporters, we've all been there, mate. We know we've been booted. We know we've been punched for no reason at all. But you just go, ah, let's get on with it. But when ninety six people are killed, their mothers, their wives, their children aren't going to let that go away, mate. And this is nowhere near finished. This is nowhere near finished. We want. We have. We have got the truth. We want justice now. And the justice is people being brought to boot. Everyone right to the top, including the unmentionables. The unmentionables. Uh, any comment, boys, on my statement? No, well, absolutely. Eddie, definitely. And see, see what uh, there's Jason here. And I spoke to you the other day on the phone, mate. And uh, it was the day, obviously, the verdict had come out. And obviously, I was interesting how you were feeling and stuff like that but you were actually angry rather than happy you know you were, your blood yes. was boiling and absolutely understandable because obviously in these 23 years that have passed since the terrible tragedy a lot of the parents of these kids have died along the way and they've died and they've never known that their kids names have been cleared you know the, the heartache that's passed to these people and now these wounds are opened up again but we just hope this time that justice is served and by justice I mean retribution Mm-hmm. And this should go right to the top, and people should have to pay for this, because I, I mean, I'm I'm 40 years old, so I, I I've been about a bit, and I've I've attended all the Celtic games, and hand, hard, hands up here, I'm an adopted Blues, I'm an adopted Scouse, that's why I feel strongly about this situation. So Everton's my team, and you know that, mate. But uh, I've I've followed Everton all over England, I followed Celtic all over Scotland, all over Europe. And uh, I've stood in terraces, and I've been terrified by some of the situations that I've faced. But I'll, I'll put Joe on just now, mate, and we were talking earlier, and it's Joe's, Joe's younger than myself. So, Joe, take it away and see what you want to ask Eddie. Yeah, Eddie, I mean, a lot of our listeners would be okay, younger. Joe. A lot of our listeners would be younger. And I, I'm, I'm only 33. I was 10 years old when I seen Hillsborough sort of unfolding on TV. And I, as a 10-year-old, all I kind of knew, there was something really, really, really bad had just happened, right? And for the... For, for the the week after, I kind of knew that too, but I hadn't got a full grasp on what happened, and I probably uh, have to admit didn't have a full grasp until maybe the past couple of years, when you know this the the, the call for justice became so vocal and so prominent, and I think a lot of our listeners and, and myself included wouldn't have under probably don't understand how football fans were treated back then before Hillsborough. You know, and I think maybe it, it, it might serve them well if you try to paint a picture as a guy who experienced that following Liverpool around 
uh, how football fans were treated and how what happened in Hillsborough, that attitude towards fans, it didn't really come from nowhere, you know? No, no, I mean, you know yourself, Celtic are a successful team, Liverpool are a successful team. We were we were en masse everywhere we went, and we know how to conduct ourselves. We know how to get into big games. We know how to put to police ourselves. But what they did, I think, I, I think, I think the establishment are frightened of, of large numbers of working people, and I think they do have to flex the muscles now and again, saying, "Look, we can keep you in order, and we can keep ourselves in order. We can keep ourselves in order." I've been to plenty of games at Celtic Park. I've been to games at Hampden Park. I've been to uh, Liverpool, Everton. No problems whatsoever getting in, mate. Occasionally, like Ibrox, like Ibrox, catastrophes happen. Catastrophes happen. But that was a, an accident. This was not an accident. This was perpetrated. I think it was probably a mistake by the police. But they tried the way they tried to turn it around. And, and even now, they expect they expect criminals to go hands up, boys. It's a fair cop. Even this Betterson now, this Betterson. Is saying oh, Liverpool it. Liverpool supporters who were milling around outside the ground in the sunlight that made it hard for the police. What the fuck do they expect people to do when they're going to a match? Mill around outside the ground? Of course you mill around before you get in. But um, I remember the seventies and the eighties, and people were treated like animals. People were treated like animals. And let's put our hands up. We we have bad eggs. We always have bad eggs who followed us around, which you didn't really want. And perhaps sometimes we did turn a blind eye to some of the stuff that went on. But uh, make no mistake, boys, this was this was down and out. The state against the people, without a shadow of a doubt. And the, the point to make, I was making before, the, the main one, I think, is the fact the force, 41, I think it was 41 people, were right. medically examined and said these people would have survived if the police would have just gone through the normal procedures. Now... In the next couple of days, it's going to be harrowing. They're going to actually identify the names of them people. So imagine how their mums and dads are going to feel. He felt angry for 23 years. They're going to be fucking catastrophically angry now, aren't they? I'm well, over to you, Joe. Jesus, I mean, that's, that's hard to take in. That's, that sort of information that is hard to take in. It's just, I mean, that's manslaughter. You said it, Joe. Exactly, that's what it is, and that's what we have got. Some of the top briefs, some of the top solicitors of the country, on our side now. Unfortunately, the Labour government never ever backed us. We backed the Labour. Liverpool is a Labour stronghold, and I'm absolutely disgusted the way under new Labour, Jack Straw just he was like a nodding dog. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. We don't think it can happen, and it was the people themselves. This was people power, mate. This was people power that did done this. Do you, do you think Eddie, well, Andy, Andy Burnham, do you think he gets any credit for him? Oh, that? he's brilliant. He, oh, no, yeah, I take it to him. Andy Burnham. Andy Burnham is an Evertonian. And Andy will tell you, he went to um, he went to memorial service at, um, Hill, at Anfield for the Hillsborough. And he stood up and he was a member of the Labour government at the time. And he, he got booed and he realised and he acknowledged why he got booed. He wasn't booed because he was a blue. He was booed because he was... Part of the Labour, I think he was in the Labour cabinet at the time, and from that day he took up the cudgel along with Steve Rotherham, uh, the the MP from Walton, and both of them have been tremendous. And I would say that uh, Andy has been our champion more than anyone, and it just shows you the bond of maybe between Liverpool and Everton supporters on Merseyside and Celtic. I, 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 I might add as well. Um, when you go, Paul, you're going to say them you again. Have... No, uh, fantastic stuff to Eddie. I think the key point is that people people need to be aware of what Eddie said there is the fact that this was an establishment cover up at the absolute top echelons of society here. And it was quite obvious that the incompetence of the, the top ranks of the police force, there was a, a cover up that went on immediately, which begs the question you know, how, how um, used to doing that were the British establishment? You know, the fact, again, the me, the most heart-destroying thing for me is what Eddie said, is the amount of people who could have lived but were not given the opportunity to, which was backed up by the initial inquiry that stopped at 3.15 in the afternoon 
In other words, nobody was allowed to know what went on after 3.15 in the afternoon. That's right. It's shameful, it's harrowing, and people have to be brought to justice, right up to and including Margaret Thatcher, who was at the very heart of this cover-up. Here, here. And as like, it, as, like as Eddie said, the people of Liverpool have been demonised, they have had their names ripped apart by the media, and we all know what kind of media we're talking about, and it is to their eternal credit that they were able to take on the establishment and beat them. And that's exactly what they did when they had the mighty of the Tory government, the mighty of the Labour government, they had South Yorkshire police, they had a right-wing media, every single one of them against them. But they're, the people of Liverpool were the ones left standing and all the rest of them are gone. And it's the people like Eddie that I take my heart off to because they never extinguished the flame. And that's why now they've got the truth. And as Eddie says, justice has to come next. I'll tell you what, mate, just a point of interest, just to show you how close I am to this. My business is right opposite the COP, right opposite the Albert Pub, and right next door to us is the Hillsborough Centre. Now, this is 23 years on. We have a, we have a garden at the back of the Hillsborough Centre. Jerry, who runs it, right, he's, he's counselling people there every single day, every single day. He's open from about 10 o'clock till about 3, and there's people still going in there. They're not whingers, mate. You can see they are they are distressed people. They are distressed people, and as it's been coming closer to the uh, sort of culmination of the last few weeks, there's been more and more people, and they've had this feeling of apparition that it's going to all blow up on our faces again. And I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't. But I still have this feeling of foreboding that these fuckers are going to try and riddle riddle out of it again. But mm. um. Um, you know, when you say David Cameron, he stood up and I don't think he had any option. He didn't have any option with the information that was actually in the public domain now. We just hope it's not kicked into the fucking high grass, which they always do. But, um, you know, you know, forums like this, it's, it's, it's brilliant. The, you know, I've, I, I was, I'll give you an example. Two years after this happened, I was down in Essex and I was buying a machine and a printer. This machine was 10,000 quid. Anyway, the, the, the guy I was speaking to started speaking about Hillsborough. We were in this restaurant, and he came out with the old sun bullshit. And about four or five people in the restaurant down in Essex started agreeing with him. So I stood up, and I said, I'll tell you what, mate. I told him, I, I told him the truth. A couple of Geordies stood up, started clapping. A couple of Glasgow lads, a couple of Scots lads, a couple of Welsh fellas. Typical working-class people, right? So much so, I cancelled that fucking actual uh, purchase on the spot. I said, I don't want it. He rang me up about an hour later. I went back to the, the place. Um, some other people came up to me and wanted to have it explained. They explained it to him. I made the purchase and he knocked about three grand off it. So not only did a good good purchase, but I fucking converted him as well. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but it's... But, but, but... See the thing, Eddie, as well, me and you spoke about it the other day on the phone. Essentially, Liverpool isn't an English city, you know. It's, it's certainly not. an extended part of Ireland. And it's yeah. and it's got the same sort of working class mentality as Glasgow. I mean, if you're ever if there's ever a mirror city of Glasgow, it's Liverpool. That's right. You know, it's got the exact same type of people and uh, we've got the same humour and we've got the same problems in life and high unemployment and deprivation and stuff like that. But both your cities have turned around in the last few years, you know, and there's been massive regenerations. But I just think it's not it's no bricks and mortar that make a city, it's the people. Yeah. And it's it's the people the people of Liverpool and, and even to another extent, the city of Liverpool is different for Glasgow because we've got obviously the divide between us and the team that used to be Rangers. And and, <laughs> and the, in the city of Liverpool, you've got Everton and Liverpool, and I'm I'm fully in the blue side of the city. But uh, when I started going down to derbies, you're looking at 25 years ago, and it was everybody stood together. But I reckon sort of it changed a bit, and it started getting a bit nasty. And I've seen quite a bit of trouble at derbies. But I think seen the last three years, I think it's getting a lot better, mate. And we're getting back to the ways of standing together. And I think it's something to do with. Well, I know at Wembley last season when the full ground started chanting justice for the 96, That's you know, right. that was... it's Because when push comes to shove, the Scousers will definitely stick together. That's right. Well, I've, I've heard myself, uh, by, by lads have been up to Glasgow, that the actual sort of bitterness is going a bit... It's a little bit more sort of black humour now, which uh, I applaud, you know what I mean? I, 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 
I, I, I love it. I love the banter. I love the banter. I don't like the fighting. I love the banter, mate. I think it's great. And as you say, Glasgow people, Liverpool people, Belfast people, Newcastle people, Dublin people, we will not roll over. We will not roll over. Tell you what, mate, if someone points us down, we go, I don't think so. And they picked up the wrong people this time, mate, I'll tell you. No, big time. And I think that's why... Liverpool fans have had a lot, have not not a lot of support for the wider community in England, because most people they they, they feel they basically they don't look in scousers favourably. You know, scou- scousers are the butt of jokes all over the southern England. You know, and things like that. And scousers are this, scousers are that. I mean, the headlines of the Sun are obviously been going to that Kelvin McKenzie rat. You know, but the things that they actually printed that some fans pick pockets of victims, the urinated and brave cops. Some fans beat up PCs giving the kiss of life. I mean, absolute lies. And that Tory MP, I think it was Irvin Patnick. That's right. Yeah. He was the guy that took Margaret Thatcher on a tour in Hillsborough. And it says this was the mayhem caused by drunks. Oh, Jesus. You know, he, he, he got a knighthood as well. I, I, that's, that's what exactly printed, Joe. And, it, and as Eddie says, we've all done... I mean, <laughs> Celtic's got a mad support as well. So, obviously, you've... But they're full of daftness as well. You go away from home and things happen and stuff like that. But it's up to the police to control that. And at the end of the day, it's a cup semi-final. Guys are going to have a few beers before the game. See if the police were rightly standing outside the ground and having cordons like checking people's tickets and stuff like that, then you wouldn't get near the ground. Yeah. You know, well, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what, Jason, you know, as, as, as an Everton supporter, Everton, Everton are, are notoriously for... Um, turning up late at games, it's 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 a walking ground. You know what I mean? People do buy tickets late. There's never any problems. Never any problems. I've never seen any problem whatsoever at a derby game with people getting in. I mean, our grounds aren't as big as yours. Ours is like uh, it used to be. Everton used to be seventy-two thousand. Liverpool used to be sixty. Liverpool's down to forty-five. I think Everton's about forty-two. And yeah. the, the, the supporters police themselves. We know, don't we? You know, we want self-preservation. We're not going to, you know, we're not lemons. We're not going to jump off the edge of a cliff. We know. I. It was. It was actually before the Hillsborough. It was suggested that Liverpool police should go to these semi-finals to police the lads getting in. But um, these these like um, little sorts of police forces like their own little manner on, and we can do it. You know. Well, we can please ourselves, you know that, mate, don't you? Yeah, and the, but as I say, the days are changed. But we, 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 Paul used to live in America, so Paul lived in New York, and we, we speak about like American sports and see the way they treat the fans there. They treat the fans like human beings. Exactly. See, see the thing, Eddie. Is seen, seen Liverpool at least you just can get a beer at the game. Seen Scotland, we still can't buy a beer yeah. at the game. Because of a riot in 1981, they've still banned us for having a pint at the game. I take my two kids to Celtic Park. I want to have a beer at half time, but you're not allowed to. Unless I bet you can't at Murrayfield, though. I bet you can't at Murrayfield. Oh, yeah, you can at the oh, rugby. Yeah, 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 because they, they're the upper class. You know, yeah. we're, we're just still treated like shit. You buy a season ticket, and basically that's you. That's the only thing you get for that season ticket is your seat at the game. You get nothing else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and just just imagine, point get away from me. What are the prices at, at, um, at Rangers Celtic now? Well, I don't know about them, but we our prices are actually very good, mate. To be honest with you, and uh, I, I mean, I can't complain about it. You know, it's Celtic Park for me and my two kids. My two kids have got fifty quid season tickets, and uh, my season ticket is about five fifty, so it's about six hundred and fifty quid for the three years, which is absolutely brilliant. And my three match Champions League package was eighty four quid. 28 quid a game against Barcelona, Benfica and Spartak Moscow, so I can't grumble, mate. Yeah, well, I, I, I took my two grandsons to the last game at Anfield last season against Chelsea. Now, it was, it was, it was, it was a nothing game, it was a dead rubber, Liverpool were going nowhere, Chelsea uh, in the European Cup, and it's 49 quid each for nine-year-old lads, 15-year-old lads, and me, so it was 150 quid, 147 quid to get in, you know, no concessions whatsoever, because, you know, people will pay it. People yeah. will pay it. You know, it's a, it's a religion with a small R, and it's R, isn't it? And they know, and they know. But that religion has raised its head. And when you actually attack the very soul of football supporters and tell them that they are perpetrating the deaths of themselves and other people, their own supporters, that's when you hit the nerve. I'll that, tell you, mate. I, that, that's, that's a thing I wanted to bring up. I mean, I think that... 
the similarities between Liverpool fans, Celtic fans, Everton fans, Newcastle fans, Sunderland fans, working class people, as you said, is that we've all been kind of sort of cast off as more or less a feral race. That's right. Right? But I think what made the aftermath of Hillsborough so poisonous was the fact that people went out of their way to, to, to print this stuff, to make it public knowledge, to, to, to coerce the public into thinking, this is what Liverpool fans are like. This is the worst of football fans. And that's the worst thing. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you. In my opinion, they held Liverpool fans up as being the... That these guys will wreak havoc everywhere they go. And that... When you see that young kids died, family members died, and and you, you see the names and you hear the stories, you think, how can anybody with an ounce of humanity That's right. do that? Do that to any other human being? I just think... I personally can't comprehend that. Well, uh, Stephen Gerrard's... Um, Stephen Gerrard's cousin... Um, Thomas Gilhooley was the youngest uh, man to die. He was ten years of age, and they were uh, they were going to test him to see if he had any alcohol in his blood. Mm. You know, a ten year a ten year old boy, sixty seven year old man was the oldest, and uh, they were they were, they, they were testing him. They got on the police um, records to see if he had a, a criminal record. So you know, what's he going to do? Is he going to kill himself because he's got a criminal record? Is he going to like sort of mm. charge the gates at sixty seven years of age? And young girls, and it was it was it was a family day out. It was a family day out. Semi finals are, aren't they? They're great. You know, people go, people get tickets who shouldn't get tickets to go to semi finals. You know that yourself. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. not always the supporters who get them, are they? So it was a cross section of Liverpool supporters yeah. that day. You know. So I think that's spot on, idiot. Because I mean, if you take um, Trevor Hicks's family, he was there, his wife's there, and his two daughters are there. That's right. Right. It's not four hooligans going for a fight. You know, and I think that we talked about the sun there, and I think that what, what happened with the sun was they put that headline out and they put those allegations out to make people think that the people who died were not worthy of their sympathy. They were not worthy of being grieved for, and they were not worthy to have any kind of investigation because this is the type of people they were. Because right away, as we say, the establishment had its organs out there saying, you know what, these people deserved it. They're all hooligans, they were all drunk. We'll prove yeah. that to you. Yeah. And, and, and to the eternal shame, a lot of people in Britain, some people believe that. Some well, people you know, actually believe that. Well, well, do you know Norman Norman Betterson, who they call him for his resignation now? Mm-hmm. Now, he actually, he actually, he was off duty that day, apparently, but he, he put himself on duty, as he would when he seen what was happening. Now, he put up and he got elected. He got elected as the chief constable of Liverpool. Now, four of the people, four of the people on, on, the, uh, on the panel walked off and wouldn't have anything to do with it. The families, the families protested, but he, he was in, and he was in for about four years. Now, it beggars. If he knew all that had gone on beforehand, he was privy to that. Why didn't he, when he became the chief constable in Liverpool, say, look, this is what really happened. I'm serving you people now. Yeah. They saved themselves. The police saved themselves. Save themselves and save the establishment. Nobody else. They do not save the citizens of this country. And we know that now, don't we? Yeah. I mean, absolutely horrendous. I mean, going back to the day, I mean, obviously me being sort of sympathetic to the blue half. I mean, the other semi-final, all I was worrying about that day was Everton beating Norwich. Norwich, but no, right. Nobody can even remember. Everton won 1-0 at Villa Park, but nobody even remembers that. You know, and then when the, the visions start coming through, I mean, I'm 17, 18 at the time, so I'm fully aware of what's going on. And uh, I just remember the devastation. And you just, it's hard to put any words, but shortly after that, Celtic obviously came up and uh, offered to play the benefit game. Right. You know, so we played the benefit game, and I'll tell you, mate. I mean, I got on a Celtic website, and some of the posts on that site. I mean, I, I was actually crying reading some of them. You know, and I kept my mates for Liverpool come up, and they were all blues, and they had their, they had their Everton shirts on at the game. Yeah. And yeah. it was just, I mean, it was the first time ever I'd seen away fans in the jungle. You mm-hmm. know, there was Liverpool fans yeah. all over the jungle, but see. I mean, it's not my favourite song for obvious reasons, but you'll never walk alone and see the start of the game, mate. It does it, it all, mate, doesn't it? It, it says was, it all. Everybody, everybody was crying and everything, you know, people couldn't mm. even... And there was guys just standing next to you, busting out crying all the way through the game, you know? Yeah. And it was... Oh, see, when I think back to it, it's, it's one of the surreal 
moments and you're like, it was actually there and did that actually happen? But yeah. standing at a football game with grown men <laughs> crying everywhere. You know, yeah, I mean, was... I think that, um, as you see, the, the surrealness of that game, it was completely different to anything I'd ever experienced. There was a couple of things, for example, the tradition at Celtic at the time, particularly for the jungle, was to chant the names of every single member of the Celtic team that was playing that day. Started the goalkeeper, Packy Bonner, and go right through to somebody yeah. like Joe Miller. To that day, the jungle did it with the Liverpool team. Absolutely incredible. Went through Grobola, right through to John Barnes, right? Yeah. As Jason says, you'll never walk alone with all the scarves that held up. I particularly always remember a, ba a banner that was in the main stand at Celtic Park that day that said, they're a big group of Liverpool fans, the cop thanks you all, we never walked alone. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it was just, it's something that I think, because I remember we played Aberdeen at Petrodri the day before, and there was loads of Liverpool fans of that game singing your never alone, they were crying. And it's something that even this day, you know, like 24 years on, 23 years, 23 years on, sorry, that I find it really hard to talk about that game because the depth emotion is still very strong to the point where I think on that weekend of Hillsborough Celtic played the following day against Hibs at Hampden Park. And I think to myself now, how on earth was there a football match after that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Why why was there a football match the day after? And I think it comes from the fact that we did not have mass media then. Yeah. If we yeah, had mass right. media the impact would have been far stronger immediately on people and nobody would have been interested in a football match. So it's to the internal credit that the people who did campaign to get this justice and to get this truth out, bearing in mind that this was this isn't a this isn't a trendy thing to do, you know? This wasn't something that everybody in the country just jumped on the back and said, Oh yeah, yeah, we'll help out. It was very, very few people you know, in, in the establishment or in the celebrity world of speaking out, you maybe had people like Jimmy McGovern who was putting in these programmes and stuff and, you know, it's so far ahead of his time when he brought out Cracker and the Robert Carlyle incident yeah. and that probably helped me understand the feeling of Hillsborough more than anything at that time did. And then, of course, he brought out the, um, the drama reconstruction with Christopher Eccleston and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it just, it just shows you how... That you know, people. It's easy now. We can get the word out everywhere, Twitter, Facebook, etc. You couldn't do that then, and it's to the eternal credit of the people of Liverpool that we did. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I must admit, um, you, you know, we, we have a good crack with Evertonians, and there are there are some there are in in, in, in every band of bars of people who are a bit bitter. Uh, especially you can, the consensus thing of Heisel and Everton not being in Europe, but I've never heard one Evertonian, not one, and I'll put my hand on my heart, you've ever put anything down about Hillsborough, none, none, you know, because let's face it, lads, there for the grace of God or there for the toss of coin, John, could have been you, you know me? Yeah. And, and, and that's the way it is. But as I, as I was getting back to the political side before, I'm just I'm just hoping that this may be a dawn. But I've got this feeling of foreboding that they might kick it under the grass. Um, we've got a solicitor, um, um, Mansfield. He's brilliant. He's brilliant. He's been with us for 23 years. And I just hope he holds on to the cudgel. But um, the Labour Party seems to have dragged the feet over this, except for the them two exceptions of Andy. And Andy's tremendous. Andy, he also come back from being rude at Anfield. And he actually held his hand up and he said, I know why it was, boys. And he were right. And that takes some man to do that, doesn't it, you know? Oh, big time. Yeah. See, see, see the thing as well, like, see me, this is maybe just a bit simplistic, but surely when their revelations come out, the chief constable of South Yorkshire Police should have been arrested that night. Certainly. See the certainly. chief constable of South Yorkshire Police on the 15th of April 1989. Just go and chat on that guy's door and put him into custody. I'll tell you what, mate. Start questioning still... him. It certainly is. I tell you what, they're still chasing war criminals, 90-year-old war criminals from the concentration camps and such, aren't they? Now, this is a lot. This is a lot more recent, and there's a lot more hands-on evidence, you know? Uh, they're, they're all going to try and walk. They're going to try and put it on the, on the guys who died. I think it's right. I think it's right, uh, Chief Constable Wright. But, you know, the, um, you know, the other thing, you know, Duck and Field, who actually, mm -hmm. yeah. actually gave all... He retired two days of hill health before he was brought to boot. Now, as second in command, he just, just got a complete walkover because he said it wouldn't be fair for him to take the brunt because he wasn't the main man. Fucking hell, you know, Hitler, well, what right. about Himmler and Goebbels and all them? You know, you know, they, you know, they walked the walk and they took the sword, didn't they, in the end? But um, 
you know, we're all a little bit, I'm still a bit emotional talking about this. And I think after about a week, we might have a little think about this and we might think of other ways to really nail these bastards in the end, you know. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. That's good. John, John's going to just ask you about this, um, is, is, is this sort of forum that you do. Is this a weekly thing or is it just occasional? Well, we do no, it weekly. Weekly, Joe, on you go, you take it away, mate. It's we do baby. We do it weekly. Eddie, um, we started this, me and Salvin Harper started this about maybe two years ago. And we, yeah. we, we had the idea for doing a live Monday night show. Uh, for for Celtic fans, where they could call in, just talk, and it was like say whatever you want, no holds barred, nobody gets cut off. Yeah. You know, it's like it's you know if you have a, if, if you have an opinion, ring up and discuss it, and we discuss it with you. And it started off with me and Harper talking to about fucking six people <laughs> for about a year <laughs> and a, for about a year and a half. But now like, we've added shows to it, we've added people to it. Jason and Paul, we've all made contact through Twitter and through Celtic the the internet forums and being yeah. regular regular nutcases. But uh, I mean, we're up to a quarter of a million downloads now. You know? That's tremendous. Tremendous. But I mean, I mean, it's it's all grassroots. It's all organic. It's for the fans, by the fans. Nobody makes any money off it. Nothing, nothing is, nothing is out of bounds. And it's just, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. And it, it will always be this way. You know? And yeah. it's free. Yeah, 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 just getting a point back to it, it's a Celtic and, and the team. It used to be Rangers, as you call them. Um, you know, like your sort of, I, I should imagine you'd like to get in the um, in the Premiership. You deserve to be in the Premiership. And the thing down in England is, oh, we don't let them down. They're all hooligans. I go, what supporters? They get 60,000, 50,000 every week. Surely they're better than Fulham, who get or black men. All right, all right don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not declaring black men. You know, they can get like 12,000, 15,000. I said, if we're going to have the biggest football forum, we might as well have Rangers and Celtic in it. Yeah. That's, that's something I've always thought. But that's one of the things. Rangers and Celtic are still tied with hooliganism, you know, in England. They're not in Liverpool because, you know, we know different, don't we? But that's the yeah. thing. I mean, hopefully that cycle will be broken by Rangers. By this? Disappearance, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a funny one, Eddie, to be honest with you. You know, I've, I've supported Celtic all my life and I've... I've supported them in the Scottish League all my life and I might be a weirdo but I, I'm quite happy to be in the Scottish League I'd like the Scottish League to get better and I'd like yeah. us to be part of it you know I'm I'm no uh, I'm no one of the I mean the suits they all want us to go and play in the English Premiership yeah. Yeah. but your 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 fans uh, right, say we get 60,000 right and they're Liverpool Liverpool has never won the Premier League so say Celtic 60,000 <laughs> fans and you're on about 30 years down the line we've never won the Premier League you know, do you think we'd still have 60,000 fans coming every week? That's yeah, true. I, 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 I never thought about it like that. <laughs> I don't know, mate. I don't know so much. You know, it's it's it's, it's a funny thing. You, what I, I would love to get back to the 80s in Scotland where teams like Dundee United and teams like Aberdeen were challenging to win the league. You know, I would love to get a strong league. The, we had a strong league up here. Because bear in mind, your team is lucky to beat Hearts, you know, in the UEFA Cup. Well, they played well. They played well. Hearts, but Liverpool. Let's face it, mate. Liverpool are a poor team at the moment. Yeah. Liverpool are a poor team. There's, I don't think there's any. They're probably with the, the exception of Suarez and possibly Gerrard on a good day. Any one of the top four have won any of our squad at the moment. But mm. we're like all football supporters. You know, we'll come again. It's the club. It's not the players. It's the club. No, that that and that's, a, that's, a, that's a hundred percent right, Eddie. You know, and that's that's like, like, like for our for us guys. We we've got like a sixty thousand stadium. We've got I don't know forty thousand. We've got probably about thirty thousand diehards. We've got another ten that's sort of on the brink. And then we've get we could get another twenty thousand if we were winning stuff all the time, and it was a big yeah. massive game. We I mean we've sold out the three match packages for the Champions League, so it's full houses for the three games. So yes. if if we are seeing top entertainment there, then the fans will be there. But yeah. I'm very cynical about the money and see the money they spend in England, mate. I hate it. I don't. I yeah. don't. I don't really want part of that. I don't want to be going to watch a football team with guys getting paid a hundred thousand quid a week. Yeah. I, I just don't want to go and watch that. It doesn't. Only a hundred thousand. You know. You, you know where there's there is there an analogy of Wayne Rooney. Is Wayne Rooney earns he earns two hundred and fifty grand a week, doesn't he? So the average pay in England's probably about probably about twenty twenty grand, thirty about twenty grand. So yeah. he earns what? I mean, twenties is in. It's going to take. It's like eleven years 
It's 11 years of a working man to earn what he earns in a week. Yeah, right here, but Eddie, we probably all have more hair than he does. Say again? We probably all have more hair than he does. <laughs> That's great, that, isn't it? It's great, that. Yeah. But, but it's... You can new hair anyway. I know. <laughs> I tell you a funny story. I know it's not the forum for a funny story, but when we played the Manx in the Champions League, at Old Trafford, the one we, we lost three two, one Nakamura scored the free kick. Mm. We uh, the week before, I was at the Derby Eddie and Everton had beat Liverpool three 0 at Goodison. So I, I had the ticket in my pocket and I'd forgot about it. I had the same jacket on at the game, and uh, we were in the main stand. And behind us was the uh, a box, and I turned around. It was that Colleen that was in the box who went with his brothers. So I've got the I've got the ticket for the Everton Liverpool game in my pocket. So I went up to the window and showed them it, and they were going. They were like, "Yeah, get in there, no, because they're still big blues." And then when when Celtic scored, they were cheering. <laughs> 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 yeah, so that was quite yeah. interesting. I was uh, I first went to Celtic Park in. Um, in '66, when you beat us one 0 and we beat you in the um, in the replay, the, the consensus replay. Yeah, he had a oh, what a game that was! That was, that was a tremendous game, and uh, I think we went on to we we, we got beaten the final that year, that year at Hamden uh, by Borussia Dortmund, I think it was. Yeah, but I tell you what, though, I, I, I didn't realise I went to Hamden and it was a piss poor ground, that wasn't it. Still you is. know, it was it was complete. It was completely open then, though, wasn't it? Except yeah. for one little uh, one little stand on the left hand side, and it was like sleepers, and it pissed down that day. And uh, well, we were bad that day, but we got beat two one, and that was that was fair enough. That was yeah. fair enough. I've got I've got a good mate of mine, and I'm sure he'll listen to this podcast. He's a legend, and his second team's Liverpool, Eddie. Right, so he's always he's got his faults, but uh, he wrote a <laughs> post about his mates obviously texting him after the verdict this week. Yeah. And, uh, and he's talking about how much he loves the city and Jim Jim's a legend you've met Jim he was at your first book launch Paul but uh, oh, Jim, yeah, Jim, yeah. Jim's a legend and uh, he's been all over, everywhere seen Celtic and his stories are absolutely fantastic but he's mad Liverpool supporter me and him have some right good banter about the Everton Liverpool stuff and uh, he was talking about how much he loves the city of Liverpool and his mates and how the camaraderie between us and, uh, and it's talking about everything he says about Liverpool and he just says I love the city and I'll just read exactly what he says. I've got it here. He says, I love the city. It reminds me of Glasgow like no other city in the world does. Only Dublin in the early 70s come close. A big, warm, humorous city where Glaswegians, they might have nothing, but what they have, they would share. The docks, the patter, and, of course, the football. Yeah. He says, my dad brought me back a Liverpool hat in 1966 when we played them at Anfield in the Cup Winners' Cup and always, always told me, the Scousers are like us, son. They're always skint and they're always laughing. <laughs> and he yeah. says... They've been my second team since then. And he says, a kid growing up, I was always amazed watching Match of the Day when the cameras would show the Swain singing cop. And he says, they were the first football fans to sing and chant and left a big impression on me. And he That's says, aye, the Scousers are my kind of people. Yeah. Well, uh, well our catchphrase in, in Liverpool, and it's probably the same in Glasgow, if you don't laugh, you cry. So you might as well <laughs> laugh, mate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> likes the rims, do the tremendous. Uh, and hey, it, hey lads, I'm, I'm going to have to cut this because I've, I've arranged to go. I didn't really know what's coming on this, John, until uh, until a bit earlier. But I've I've got to meet my son-in-law in the pub, and he's uh, he's uh, he's from down south, and he doesn't know his way around. So can I just cut off here and thank Eddie, you the boys? Absolutely, absolutely. Come on again, Eddie. Come on again from other time. Eddie, it's been no a pleasure, worries, mate. Eddie. Thank you very much for taking the time out to speak to us. It's been uh, it's been an education. All right, good lads, and you know, like, and you know, if you ever want to ring me up about anything, or you ever want any lads want any tickets to watch Liverpool, I can I can usually get them. Ah, you're, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> Here, Ali, I may take you up just. <laughs> Ali, I may I may take you up to, just to piss Jason off. Aye, yeah. Uh, we'll, all, we'll, all, we'll all come along and get big Liverpool scarves and pokes and all that. <laughs> aye, aye. I'll, I'll be doing it that in October, mate. I'll be in the park end, don't worry about it. <laughs> all right, lads. Thanks, Eddie. Brilliant, Eddie. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you. Good luck. Cheers. All right, good lads. Thanks, nice, mate. God bless. Bye. Right. So there you go, folks. That's the uh, bonus Homeboys podcast, Justice for the 96. Uh, and we want to thank Eddie Bainer for coming on and speaking to us and uh, just captivating us and educating us on uh, Hillsborough and the people of Liverpool. And I think uh, Paul and Jason want to speak themselves about what we just uh, experienced. And uh, we'll give Paul uh, the first go.
Yeah, it's uh, incredible to hear uh, Eddie's thoughts and uh, recollections, and more importantly, the passion and the, the commitment uh, that came through his stories and his voice. And you can see why, even after such a lengthy time, uh, 23 years, that the, the people of Liverpool finally got the truth. And I'm sure everybody out there listening, and certainly the speak for us and the panel, will say that we'll be back in everything we can to make sure they get justice. Absolutely, and I echo the words you used to, and just delighted that Eddie called in. I've obviously a good friend of mine, Ian McDonald in Liverpool, was a big Evertonian, set up this uh, chat with Eddie, and I spoke to Eddie a few times on the phone before this, and the guy's extremely emotional over what's happened. But uh, no, all credit to him to come on and tell us his story and sort of paint a picture for us what the people of Liverpool have been putting up in the last 23 years. And I just, I'm absolutely sure there's 96 uh, souls looking down on Eddie and smiling at him the night because he's just one of the other guardian angels that's trying to do the damage for the people that lost their life in that terrible tragedy. And just hopefully we get some justice coming soon. And it should start right at the top. Here, here, absolutely. Um, nothing more, nothing more to be said, really. I think. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hail, hail. <laughs>